It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time-poor parent who just wants answers now. The premise of the book, Trent Dalton goes and sits in Brisbane CBD at a chair, table, with a typewriter. Type, type, type. I can't speak. Typewriter. <laughs> and he sets it up so people walk past and there's just a sign. Can you please tell me a love story? And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. This is the podcast where Kylie and I talk about not parenting, which is kind of unusual because almost all of our episodes are about parenting. But once a month, we talk about something else that we care about a lot. We talk about book club. Um, Not that there is a specific book club that we're promoting, but rather uh, the books that we've been reading because we think that well, everyone loves books. Everyone loves a great book or recommendation. And so we're going to dive into the books that we've been reading. And normally we get all carried away and excited about how many books we've read. And I'll usually have four or five and Kylie will have a handful. Today, Kylie, uh, not so many books. I'm working through my third book for the month just now, but you have only read one this month. I'm not, dis- I'm not disappointed in you. I'm just saying. Seriously, I feel like I just got a tardy. <laughs> no, you didn't get a tardy. Unbelievable. I actually it's have a much three shorter. books going on at the moment. I've right. never been a person to do that, but I'm actually jumping between books at the moment. I just yeah. am not feeling the vibe every now and again, and so I pick something else up and I start that. But I, I mentioned last month that mm. I had a book that I've been working through, and it's been quite a heavy read for me so yeah. it's what's taken up my focus and i do real i didn't mean to sound so yeah sure critical so judgmental hey I've, I, I've, get, I get in trouble because i have four books to talk about and today i only have one and you're disappointed i know i'm so sorry <laughs> i only have two i'm only going to talk about two so we're kind of we're it's well, been a we busy can tell who started bike riding again, yeah I mean, can't we <laughs> started bike riding. and i've watched i've watched a bit of tv you have been watching a bit of tv ted lasso season three it's back out i've been watching that shrinking show on apple tv with harrison ford uh i, I also watched all's quiet on the western front the war movie and uh, of course because of all the airplane rides there's uh, there's been a lot more tv than normal so i you cannot blame TV on aeroplane rides. Okay, and but basically, it's it's been the bike ride, bike riding four till six in the morning most mornings, and that really does curtail my ability to read. I <laughs> I lay in bed and I read like two paragraphs and I'm gone because I'm getting up at four a.m. It's really hard to do it all. So let's start with your book, and then we'll dive into my two. So I picked up a book called Bonds That Make Us Free, yes. Healing Our Relationships, Coming to Ourselves, and it's by C. Terry Warner. Um, this book has really challenged my thinking. It's been really confronting for me to read it because I, I guess the premise of it is he's actually asking us to take responsibility for our feelings. Yeah. We have experiences and people make us upset and we, we blame them for the negative emotions that we're experiencing, but it's actually our choice to respond to those circumstances um, in whatever way we choose to. And for lots of us, we choose to stay in these patterns of negative emotion, but we blame it on somebody else and think that if only that person didn't exist or if only that person didn't do that, then I could be happy. Um, but he kind of challenges that whole thought process and suggests that it's really comes down to, to us and how we choose to live our lives. Mm. It's a hard thing to hear, especially I, – I don't know that the book has aged particularly well. It's about 20, 25 years old now. It was written around the turn of the century. Um, and I read this maybe a decade ago, mm. and I loved it. I think that the principles that it teaches are more important now than ever. It's a, it's, it's a sublimely – well thought through book, but I think it does kind of get overcomplicated now and then. And I'm also not sure that some of the ideas that he's shared have aged well in the way that he's shared them. The ideas are still relevant and and I would argue right, but I think in 2023, he would probably write the book differently. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because probably the first half, it was kind of like just hit every page was hitting me with mm. these massive moments of, oh, wow, I can see how I do that or I can see how that is actually impacting in a negative way relationships that I hold dear. But then I kind of got to about the middle and it just felt like I was wading through murky water and it wasn't particularly clear and it felt overly complicated. Yeah. And so I pushed through it because I actually want I, – I actually – am invested in what he's trying to teach me, but I did feel that he kind of lost his way in being able to help, you know, 
the average person really grasp the concepts of what he was trying to share. So something that you may not be aware of, I don't think I've shared this with you before, Terry Warner, who wrote the book, it's called Bonds That Make Us Free, is also one of the guys in charge of the Arbinger Institute. Yeah, and I picked that up. He he mentions that a little bit. So there's two books by them. One is called The Anatomy of Peace. Which and the, read. the other one is called Leadership and Self-Deception. And the ideas in Bonds That Make Us Free are repeated and I guess refined in those two books as well. So that could be another way forward. People certainly have responded very well to those two books and Terry Warner and another guy called Jim Farrell. Unfortunate surname, I know, <laughs> but Jim Farrell and uh, Terry Warner are the two guys behind the Arbinger Institute. Uh, but but obviously Bonds That Make Us Free is a uh, – well, what did you think? Well, how, how would you rate it? Not religious. Mm-hmm. But definitely there is an element of God to the conversations that I had. Ah, uh, okay. I don't and, remember that. And there is a there is a lot of um, anecdotal experiences to kind of help you see the principles in action yep. and how they play out. And what's wonderful is actually he will often share those experiences and then he'll share – you know uh, where they've cu- where they've gotten to years later, or even after attending a workshop with him, and how they've come to their own understanding of the, I guess, um, self delusions that they've found themselves in. Um, but I, I, if I was going to give it a rating, I probably would only give it a three. Wow! Because it just I just got lost in the middle of it all. Um, just, just the complicated yeah, detail. Just, yeah. Right. Okay. But, uh, it, but it was well worth reading, mm-hmm. and I don't know. Maybe I actually need to read it again to really grasp what he was trying to share in that middle section. What I gained from reading it was that I can spend all the time I want blaming other people for the way I feel. And I could be justified in feeling those feelings based on the experiences I have. But I can't move forward until I'm willing to let go of those feelings. And I think forgiveness, I've heard people say before, forgiveness is not for the the person, it's for ourselves. And he talks about that process in a very different way to what I have previously heard and acknowledges that forgiveness is actually for both of you. The opportunity we have to forgive other people is to recognise their humanness, to recognise until we're able to forgive, we see them as a hindrance to our well-being and peace We don't see them as an individual with their own lives and their own issues and their own challenges and their own weaknesses. They're just a hindrance to what we're trying to achieve in our lives. But until we're able to see them as a person just like you and me who is doing the best they can but but messing it up just like I am on a day-to-day basis, then we're held back from all of the things that we can experience and all the goodness that life has to offer us. But it's, it's a choice that we make. It's really interesting listening to what you're saying. I've jumped onto Goodreads to see what other people thought of the book. It's been highly rated. So there are uh, 4,481 ratings with an average of 4.34. But the, 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 the commentary that people are basically making if they're not giving it five stars is pretty much associated with what you've just said. Uh, I made myself finish the book. The ideas were so helpful, but I really had to – guts it through the parts that Mm. were either complicated or that I didn't quite agree with. Uh, I I agree with you. I think the book is profoundly good, but it's probably about 100 pages too long and a little bit too complicated. But wow, if you want to learn about yourself and how – they they talk about self-betrayal. Yeah, uh, yeah. The way we betray ourselves, it's a really it's a really profound book. And, and I love how it says on the back, we are responsible for feelings like anger, envy, and insecurity that we've blamed on others. It's a real – like if you, you kind of sit down and give yourself a couple of uppercuts in that first half of the book, right? Mm. It's, it's just punch after punch after punch. And yet as you're reading it, you know that it's true. 
Yeah. In one of the closing paragraphs, he just says this. He says, in my experience, there is one personal characteristic upon which all else turns, one that clarifies, simplifies, and focuses us, that makes us effective when we're not even trying to be effective. It's not intelligence, wit, charm, or even stubborn determination. Since all these become negative when we're self-absorbed, no, the key characteristic is a consistent readiness to yield to the truth in all circumstances, no matter what the apparent cost. It's really easy to blame someone else for the way we feel, but it actually comes down to us. Bonds That Make Us Free by Terry Warner. That's Kylie's book for the month. Uh, Next month, Kylie, I'll try not to sound disapproving no matter how many books you've read. Let's dive into my two. What's your first one? So the first one I, I mentioned in our last book club conversation that I was reading a book that I think could be my book of the year. I'm not sure if it's going to be my book of the year, but golly, it was good. Very, very good book. So the book is called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century by Louise Perry. And the book is essentially a critique on uh, so much of what has happened as a result of the 1960s sexual revolution. And the central argument in this book is that the sexual revolution has done more to harm women than to help women. Not that the author is arguing that we should go back to the way things were in the 50s. And there's clearly problems with that. But essentially, so many of the changes that were supposed to be empowering for women and so many of the challenges that were supposed to be overcome so that women could live better lives have really um, actually made life better for men more than for women, especially in terms of quote-unquote sexual freedoms. Um, Men are far more sexually free and women are far less sexually free as a result of those changes. Uh, So she acknowledges plenty that is good that's come from the sexual revolution, but plenty is problematic. It's a really complicated book. I I don't think she actually totally nailed it, but it's such a, such a tough topic to take on. Um, and, and I think that it was still brilliantly well done. I would give it like a four, four and a half star rating. Not sure I can give it five, but I give it five stars for taking on a topic that almost no one else would ever be willing to go at. Uh, and it was it was provocative and it was eye-opening, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum. Like you could be completely liberal or completely conservative and read it and go, so long as you're willing to wrestle with ideas, you could genuinely get into it and 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 wrestle with the things that she says. And and I think that is really, really great. Some of the topics that she takes on, which again, really brave. She argues categorically that men and women are different. And I know that's a very provocative thing to say. Her argument is strong. And in the light of the, the current podcast that I'm absolutely absorbed by, which is about J.K. Rowling. It's called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. It's uh, been uh, released recently by the Free Press. Incredible podcast and there's a a high level of alignment in terms of the thinking that's going on there Um, she emphasizes that some desires are actually bad uh, indicates that loveless sex is not empowering argues that consent is not enough tells us that violence is not love that people are not products and then makes the argument that marriage is good so these are all I, I think really profoundly important things to talk about. And we live in, in 2023, we live in a world where there's actually not allowed to be conversation about some of these things. And that's authoritarian, that's dangerous, because when we stop having conversations about these things and stop considering that there could be more than one view in either direction, that undermines our ability to make progress. So does she have a conservative background? Uh, no, she's actually quite – it's it's very much a feminist book, but there's all different kinds of feminism. There's radical feminists, there's more liberal feminists, there's uh, – like, feminism can go in a whole range of different directions, and that's one of the reasons that feminism has a bad name because there are some people who say things that everyone else disagrees with, and then we, we – so there, there are so many different ways to approach it, but she's, she's quite – I wouldn't say that she's a conservative author. I, I, I just wouldn't say that. Um, is that because she's tackling a topic that would, for all intents and purposes, be considered taboo? Or is no, that because no, of she's, her she's, standpoint? She's clearly feminist. Like, she's not coming at this from a religious or a conservative point of view. She's saying um, we need women to be empowered. We need women to have equality. And the sexual revolution has not given us what it promised. That's really the, the thrust of it. And it's – I mean – Look out, coarse language, strong themes, heavy content. Uh, and a few times it was a little bit beyond me because I'm not heavily feminist 
um, theory oriented. It's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but great book, great book, really provocative, really thought provoking. And so even though, like with your book, you gave it three out of five, but it's still a darn good book and yeah, it's still so worth I'm, reading. I'm giving it, I really want to clarify that because I'm giving it three out of five because as as a read, it was hard. Hard to read, yeah. But, but if I was going to base a rating on the principles taught in it, it would be a five. Like mm. the principles are life-changing principles if you can grasp them, but the delivery of those principles let, let it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I reckon I, – I just reckon this is a very, very strong book. I just – again, while we were talking, I've looked it up on Goodreads. This has got a, like uh, nearly a 1,000 ratings at an average of 4.36. People are definitely engaging with the material and – and it's the kind of book that forces you to engage with some really tricky stuff. So that was my first book uh, that I wanted to mention. The other one, and I'll just mention it briefly because our time is pretty well up, is a book that you got me for Valentine's Day, Love, Love Stories, Stories by Trent Dalton. How did I go? Did I go to pick a good one? It's a it's a really funny one because – so let, let's just be really clear. I'm, I'm going to dive into Goodreads again. There has been 9,332 ratings on this book. It sold well uh, with an average of 4.19 out of 5. So people have loved it. The premise of the book, Trent Dalton goes and sits in Brisbane CBD at a chair, table, with a typewriter. So he carries it in and carries it home each day. Chair, table, typewriter. Type, type, type. <laughs> I can't speak. Typewriter. And he sets it up so people walk past and there's just a sign. Uh, can you please tell me a love story or author seeking love stories or whatever the sign says. And people are stopping and telling him love stories. He does it for two months. First off, Trent Dalton, my hat goes off to you. The number of people who you probably would never normally want to have a conversation with who stopped, threatened him. Like he, he, you can tell as you read the book that he had some unexpected conversations with some unexpected people. And quite often he must have been sitting there going, I really, really, really want to be kind here, but this is driving me up the wall. And yet he honours those people so beautifully in the book. He honours everybody so well in the book. So last month I talked about joining Beck Sparrow's book club. Yes. And they actually did Trent's book last year. Okay. And if you're a member, you can listen to Oh, you can reports. listen to the old conversation. That's right. Yeah. So I actually listened to an interview with him. And what he acknowledged was that he actually preferred to be in conversation than not because – the confrontation of being, you know, this nerdy guy with a typewriter sitting in the middle of a busy CBD, yeah. CBD was pretty overwhelming and quite confronting for him. So he actually would prefer to talk to anybody. Anyway, and, and he did talk to anybody. <laughs> like he, he and, 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 but he really honoured them and he honoured their stories and he put many of those stories in. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. Um, Trent's a, a swear a lot kind of guy, which I find frustrating. Every now and again, I think that he just sank into saccharine syrupy sweetness, which was a bit too much for me. But the highs of the book, the highs are magnificent. They're like 500 out of five. There are a few pages that I turn, I just went, oh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful story. There were pages that were among some of the most beautiful pages of love that I've ever read anywhere. And I just loved that. There were also some things where I was like, you know what, I'm kind of a bit over this or I'm not loving the syrupy sweetness here. It's, it's just gone a little bit too far. Uh, and, and so overall, I'm going to give him like a four. I just the highs, the highs were so beautiful that it, it has to be at least a four. But if those highs weren't there, I think I would have struggled with the book. Definitely beautiful in terms of heartfelt humanness. And I, I, I love his willingness to sit down and have these conversations with people. I think I might do that for my next book about raising boys. I'm actually genuinely, legitimately thinking that that could be, I don't know, fun or crazy. One, one, maybe both. Maybe both. <laughs> We'll talk about the books that we've been reading again next month. And I think based on an email that we got from Claire, Claire's a Happy Families podcast listener, podcast at happyfamilies.com.au if you want to get in touch with us. And she said, what about kids' books? You've got kids. Can they tell us a bit about what they're reading? So we're going to You bring- know, that's so funny because Lily was sitting in the car with me last month when our book club podcast episode dropped. Yep. dropped. And she was listening and she said, can I join this? Can I do this? She that's said, so because good. she said, you're talking to parents and they've got kids and I read a lot of books. She's really queued up. She wants to do it. All right. Maybe we can uh, get 12-year-old and, and seven, eight. Oh, hang on. Oh, she, no, she's nine. We, we can get this. We, we'll, get, we'll get them all. 
I don't know if we're going to, we might have to How just, long do we have? Yeah, book club podcast is going to be all month. Uh, thanks so much for listening today. We hope that those books are interesting to you and that the conversation was um, intriguing. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rowan from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. We can't wait to talk to you again tomorrow on the Happy Families podcast where we dive into our I'll Do Better Tomorrow episode where we focus on how we can be better parents based on our positives and negatives of the week that was. Mm-hmm.